الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستحده ونتوب اليه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يص الله ورسوله فقد غوى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له خلقنا من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء وأشهد أن النبي محمد عبد الله ورسوله النبي قدوة والمر والمرب والمرب والمر والمرب الأسوة صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان من الرجل والنساوات وسلام تسليم كثيرة أما بعد الحمد لله رب العالمين Praise be to Allah, we praise Him and we seek His help and guidance. We repent to Him and we seek His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evils of our own selves and from our evil deeds. Whomever obeys Allah and His Messenger has been guided and whoever disobey Allah and His Messenger has gone astray. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah alone with no partner or associate. He created us. He created us from one soul from which he created its mate. And he created from them many men and women. I bear witness that our Prophet Muhammad is the slave of Allah and his messenger. The Prophet, leader and educator. May Allah send blessings and peace upon him, upon his family and companions and those who follow them in truth. Both men and women. We welcome you brothers and sisters, well, not brothers, but I say brothers because, you know, even though they're not on this site, we uh, know that this information should also be for brothers too. Uh, and I'm used to saying brothers and sisters in uh, congregational of brothers and sisters. So sometimes you'll hear me say that. Sometimes if I'm talking to a close sister of mine, I call her Aki. Because I'm always talking to brothers. So when I'm speaking to her, I say Aki, right? Or Ak, you know. But uh, that's just the conditioning process of always coming from a male perspective. And, and sometimes that has to be broken because we're also dealing with women. And in the Quran, uh, uh, one of these uh, feminist or uh, socialist women, right? Uh, right? Uh, yeah, sure enough, uh, Brother Hudayfa. Some of the feminist women, right, uh, Abu Hudayfa knows, they seem to say, why is the Quran always being addressing to men, right? Why is it addressing to men? It don't mean women. And if you notice in grammar, it teaches you that it's talking to both. And even if it says mankind, it means women as well, right? 
So a lot of times we're literally looking for them to say specifically, ladies and gentlemen, you know, this is the American style, you know. But grammar helps us to understand uh, what we call mudakkarun wa muannathun, male and female agenda, and how it's formulated in the grammar. So that's why we need to affiliate ourselves with the word of Allah, which grammar surrounds around the Qur'an, the word of Allah. So, you know, um, in dealing with this uh, topic, you know, uh, marriage, I mean, this is a big topic, so I'm just going to sh share a few pointers about those who are pursuing marriage as new shahadas and talk a little bit about this situation because the social issues that Islam really paid a great deal of attention to and that it, it, it encourages in the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the issue of marriage and because of the spiritual and worldly interests that it serves the wisdom behind it and the many benefits and sublime feelings that it brings and it is a, a social necessity that is required for the continuation of life and the formation of families. It is the epitome and the cornerstone of society. So the establishment of morality, including lowering the gaze, protection of chastity, increasing the number of, of children, and perpetuating the human race is the only legal standard of intercourse. So it is endeared to human souls that it is dictated by sound human nature, sisters. It, in, it is encouraged greatly by Islam and it is sought by those with sound reasoning and is in home is is it's in harmony with the sound nature of things and through it you have many tribes that bond with one another and people are formed and nations have increased through the institution of marriage and it brings also a psychological well-being a peace of mind enjoyment of life, blessings and cooperation in sharing the burden of social life. It also is sufficient to note that is one of the signs of Allah that are indicative of his wisdom and that call to ponder the greatness of the creation and the beauty of his handwork. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa min ayatihi an khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwajan li taskunu ilayha wa ja'alla baynakum mawaddata wa rahmah inna fi zalika la ayatin li qawmi yattafakkarun Allah says and among his signs wa min ayatihi among his signs this is possessive pronoun which is possessive, min ayatihi, his signs, and khalaka lakum min nafsikum, that he has created you, right, from you, as wajan, wives, from among yourselves, litaskunu, which is basically that you may find, some people use the word repose, but it comes from sakim, right, tranquility, tranquility, right, among yourselves, and you will find tranquility within them. Litaskunu, which is plural, ileha, which is feminine. So you're finding, the man is finding tranquility, right? And security in her, his mate. Waja'alla baynakum, right? Because he has put between baynakum mawadda. Mawadda is more than love, right? The, the word love, you know. Uh, the word hub, right? The hub, hub comes from the inner gut, hub, right? So it expresses more than this English word love. It means affection, 
affection between you, compassion between you, wa rahma. The two uh, descriptions of having this love and deep compassion for one another and affection within both of the mates. This is the, 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 the epitome of a relationship because if there's no muwadda in my heart for my mate, there is no relationship. If there is no rahma, no compassion from the word rahm, which means womb, right? And womb is something that produces uh, children. So it is a mercy that Allah allows us to come from the mother and the affection that is shown between the womb and the child so that the affection of the mother develops within the womb and the attachment that it has for its mother. And so therefore, as we, we are affectionate with our mates, which helps us to have this love and compassion that we have between each other, Verily indeed in that there are signs for who? A people who reflect, a people who consider and reflect upon this relationship between man and woman. I mean deeply reflect on the conditions that are laid on the man and the woman. So the issue of marriage has changed from being shari, a issue, a human necessity, and a great act of worship if it is done with sincere intentions. And it has become a serious social problem. And this is not because of its inherent nature. Rather, it is because of what people have introduced to it that is not connected to it in any way that has nothing to do with it from the point of view of the Sharia, the Islamic legislation. And these matters have become matters because of what people have introduced to the issue of marriage. And things that are regarded as essential, without which marriage is not complete, as if this is what marriage is all about. When you look at the people's marriages in the community, do not assert that what you're seeing in the marriages of society is truly what the marriage of the Qur'an has implemented. And this is what happens. People are using the standard of other people's relationships as marriage. So people say, I'm not going to get married. Man, marriage is not for me. Why? Because they're looking at everybody's dysfunctional marriages as the basis and standard for marriage. And so that's what chased people away, right? A lot of times. And that's not an excuse even on the behalf of the people. But these are the realities that are happening here, right? So marriage is not complete as if this is what marriage is all about. So this is the result of adhering to the silly customs and the jahiliya traditions and blindly following the worthless aims and seeking to show off of the teachings uh, or the cultural things that we see in the community that we're seeing today, right? Now, when we look at this, where we see all the obstacles to marriage, many uh, written articles deal with the matters that are preoccupied by these times. And so some of these things in individuals and families, they're undermined and broken up, right? And the society has become hoarse. They become hoarse from the warnings against what accompanies marriage and the problems that are complicated, right? And the actions of traditional un-Islamic practices that we're beginning to see. So if you look at one of the uh, Imam Ahmed and Al-Bayhaqi, who narrated from Aisha, radiallahu anha, inna azam al-nasai barakatan aysaruhunna ma'unat. The most blessed of women is the one who is most affordable, right? The one who is most affordable. Those who basically go against the guidelines, right? That the woman that is most affordable, meaning the ones who are simple in their dowry, right? Now, marriage is one of Allah's laws, right? Because Allah says, 
ومن كل شيء خلقنا زوجين which means two pairs لعلكم تذكرون we have created all things in what uh زوجين two pairs that perhaps لعل لعل which is one of the sisters uh, uh, is a sister is a sister language لعلكم means perhaps you لعلكم تذكرون perhaps you may reflect or take in consideration you may remember so this applies to the human beings who are made of male and female pairs as well and humankind started with who our father Adam and our mother Hawa right so Allah says ya yuannas taqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha o people reverence your lord who has created you from what a single soul min nafsin wahida a single soul wa khalaqa minha created from its mate and dispersed from both of them many men and women so this is one of the foundational ayats that deals with how Allah created the beginning of civilization. Ya yuannasu inna khalaqanakum man dhakara wa unfa. O people, we have created you from one male and a female and have done what? Wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. We have created you in nations and tribes so that you would know one another. And some put so that you won't despise, but it don't say that in the Arabic. It says, let ta'awa rafu, and that's it. And after that comes, inna akramakum in the Allahi athqahum. And that the noblest among you in the sight of Allah is who? Right? The one who is more pious. In the Allah alimu khabir. Very Allah is all knowing and all, and all aware. So, and then the reproduction of humans, as Allah mentions, Wallahu ja'ala lakum man anfusikum azwajan. And Allah has given you spouses from yourselves. Wa ja'ala kum man azwajikum banina wa hafada. Right? Wa hafada, which is basically children, grandchildren, and has provided you with what? And provide it with the things of good sustenance. So Islam urges the Muslims to marry. This is what we want to establish. Uh, so that we won't be saying what the Jahiliya people of society say. I'm never going to get married. Because marriage is like tying yourself down. You know, like it's a taboo to get married or something like that. So... This word, uh, nikah, in the Islamic text for marriage, but in the original Arabic language, nikah, it means intercourse. So if you was to say to an Arab, I want to have nikah with your daughter, he will fight you. Because in the original Arabic language, it means intercourse. But it was then applied to marriage agreement, because it means to intercourse, it's the only way that you have intercourse and makes it legal through marriage. So, if you make the statement is that he performed nikah on the daughter of so-and-so, it means that he executed the agreement. Because nikah, from akal, means to have a contract or tying a knot, literally, linguistically. So, you hear the people say, are you tying the knot? They don't even know this comes from an Arabic word. I'm tying the knot, meaning that you're making a contract as a knot ties together where it doesn't come loose. So you're tying your relationship between you and there's a contract being made between the woman and the man, right? So he performed, and when you, if you say he performed nikah on his wife, this means that he's having sexual intercourse. So we have to, uh, it depends on how we, 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 we terminize the word, right? So basically, the Prophet وسلم, he said, young men, those among you who can afford marriage, 
should do so. For it helps to do what? Lower the gaze and guard the private parts. And those who can afford it should fast. If you can't afford it, you should fast. For fasting is a repression for the desire. So this is the concept of why marriage is very important in terms of being able to do such. And you should marry alaykum bil ba'ati faman lam yasta'a fa alayhi bisawmi fa innahu lahu wija'a. You should marry and those who cannot afford it should fast because it restrains their desires. Right? So the importance of doing such in this marriage contract, right? It's very important that we understand why we marriage. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna al-mar'ata tuqbalu fi suratil shaitan. A woman approaches in the form of a devil and moves away in the form of a devil. When any of you finds in a woman something that attracts him, he should go to his wife because she has the same as the other woman has and that satisfy his desire. So this marriage is the benefits. It, it, it lowers the gaze because this is what happened to the Prophet wasallam when he was at the marketplace. He seen a beautiful woman, so he rushed home quickly to his wife because that shows you that if you can afford to get married, it helps create an environment not of discord and fitna. So therefore he went home to his wife because what you seen is what you got home. You so? So this is how he taught us in terms of why marriage, it lowers the gaze and prevents from a lot of things. And that is only if a person's desires is in check already. Because even so, people are still committing zina, even being married. So let's look at the case at hand. But we're talking about the, the prerequisites here. So they become hunna, hunna libasul lakum. They are a garment for you. Wa antum libasul lahunna. And you are a garment for them. So this is the lawful fulfillment of desire. The lawful fulfillment of desire. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and it was reported by Ibn Umar ibn Amr, radiallahu anhumah, he said, the Prophet said, ad-dunya kullaha mata'un. This life is a temporary accommodation. Wa khayru mata'i dunya mar'atu salihat. And the best of its accommodation is a righteous wife. This is, now we're going into the area of how to choose. Because most of our problems that in our marriages is because we're using other, other, other uh, alternatives of how to choose a mate. Right? Look at the problem today. We are looking at this website, subhanAllah, that you have to pay $5, $5 in order to even get the chance to have to see who you're going to marry. So put $5 here on your credit card. You can use Master or Visa or the logos of Visa on your MasterCard, and we'll charge you $5 with tax, a 2% fee, just so that you can set up yourself to get married. Where are they getting this stuff from? This is very unlawful. No good. And this, you got people promoting this stuff. They're promoting this stuff. So what are the reasons and what are the ways and how do we choose mates? You know, the Prophet wasallam was the best. And he tells us a woman is married for four reasons. Tunkaha al-mar'atul araba. Limaliha, wal hasabiha, wal jamaliha, wal iddiniha. Fadfar bidat iddin. Tatarabat yadak. A woman is sought in marriage for four reasons. They are sought for what? Limaliha, wealth. Right? Wal hasabiha, social status, their lineage, and wajamaliha, their beauty, and deen, fathfar, seek, fathfar, means to seek, and is in a commanding form, and is in an ordering form, so 
despite of all the other reasons she sought for, the real reason that you should seek a mate is for her righteousness and her deen. And he, he asserts that as with success. So you will never be successful if you choose mates for other reasons other than deen. So that's why we have a lot of problems in marriage because one of the conditions of marriage, sisters, is that you have to have wali. You have to have a wali. How could the internet and Facebook be the wali? These are the new world orders of the new wali, uh, the uh, artificial walis, the, uh, where people are looking online for a man. Now you complain why your marriage is all broken up because you choose the guy online, didn't know nothing about him. A person sells himself online. You don't know what he's really about. And women are very deceived by the uh, voice of the man. You know, he seems like a good brother. Look at his website. That's your criterion. Look at his website. Look, he says he's of the Salaf, and he has the long name, Abdul Aziz, a Salafiya. So you like, Astaghfirullah. You say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I found the good one. You don't know who he is. This is not the official way of choosing a man anyway, going on the internet. And many women are doing it. And now we got these hustlers, these artificial American Muslim hustlers, who now are advertising it on the computer, uh, $5 to get you started. This is something that is never heard of in the time of the Prophet وسلم, in terms of how you choose mates. We're not talking about technology because they didn't have that technology. My point of reference is that these are not the methods. He tells us how we should seek out. You have to have a wali, a guardian, someone appointed. And a lot of people are doing shotgun walis, which is a problem today. The hookup, we call it. The hookup. Yeah, you know, don't worry about it. I'll get my man. I'll get my man and my man will, 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 will marry us. Let me tell you something about Atlanta here. Down here in Atlanta, subhanAllah, they have, and I'll hate to say bismillah marriages because it's not, but this is what they say. We're going to say bismillah and we're married. So the brother says, listen, sister, we're going to get married, right? And some of the sisters don't even know the idea of how it goes. So he goes, all you have to do is say bismillah, and then I say it three times, and then you say it three times, and we're married. And I had many cases like this, right? And... I asked the sister, did you have, did y'all have relationship? She said, yes. I said, sister, you committed zina, you and the brother. You need to free yourself from that and ask for tawbah from Allah. Because if you didn't know, you committed zina. And if you did know, you committed zina. So the problem here is that we need to understand what is the marriage and how marriage is performed by the Quran and the Sunnah. And that based on these other artificial programs that are being put out there that's deceptive, that's causing a lot of problems in the Muslim community. Now, what are the marriage contracts, right? How do you do marriages? And this is another problem. I always ask, how did you get married? Did the imam perform khutbah tahaja? He said, what is that? No, you know, there was no verses read. There was just, you know, uh, like a ceremony like the Christian preacher. I said, this is, this is, you have to do the conditions over, you know, because it, it is desirable to deliver a sermon before concluding the marriage contract. And this sermon is called the Sermon of Ibn Mas'ud. And it may be delivered by the one who concludes the contract or by anyone else of the attendance. And its wording is as follows. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده لا فلا مودل لا ومن يدلل فلا حادي لا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Verily, all praises belongs to Allah. We praise Him and ask His help and forgiveness. And we turn to Him in repentance. We seek refuge with Him 
from the evil of ourselves and from the evil of our deeds, whomever Allah guides, for him there is no misleader, and whomever he leads astray, for him there is no guide. And I testify that there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah, and I testify that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger. And this is related by the five compilers of the Hadith, and it is deemed Hassan uh, by At-Tirmidhi. So this is one of the things and requirements when you're getting married, so that sisters won't get caught out there where a person comes to you and say, you say Bismillah three times, and I say Bismillah three times, and we're married. And after the delivering of the sermon, the following three verses of Allah's book, the Qur'an, are to be recited. And you will find that in Ali Imran, which is 3 and 102, right? Ya 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 amanu ittaqu rabbakum No, subhanAllah. Ya ayyuhalladina amanu ittaqu that's it. Right? Oh, you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared, and die not except in the state of Islam. I want you sisters to write these verses down so that you could know. That would be Ali Imran, which is 3 and 102. And then after that, the second verse will be An Nisa, verse 1. That's 4 and 1. Ya yuladina aminu taqula rabbakum uladi khalakakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaka minha zawjaha wa bassa minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a wa taqula haladi tasa'alu nabihiri Subhanallah Bihi war arham inna Allah kana alaykum rakiba I'm speeding Subhanallah O mankind fear your Lord who created you from one soul and created from it its mate and dispersed from both of them men and women and fear Allah through whom you ask one another and the wombs. Indeed, Allah is ever over you an observer. And that is four and one. The third verse will be Al-Ahzab. Al-Ahzab, which is basically 33 and 70 and 71. Right? Ya ladina aminu taqullah wa kulu kawlan sadida. Right? Wait, right? Sadida, uh, right? Sadida. You know what, subhanAllah, how could you forget these words? You say it all the time in the kuppah. Ya yuladina aminu taqula wa kulu kala sadidan. Come on, help me out. Help me out, uh, Abdul Hakim. But these are the verses you say, right? And this is the verse you say when you are doing the kuppah tahajah, right? And that's the one that you go by when it comes to the third verse, right? Ya ayu ladina aminu taqullah wa kulu kawlan sadida yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yakfi lakum danubakum wa may yuti ilaha wa rasuluhu fakad fa'ada fawzan azimah Subhanallah. See, when you are teaching, and it's different when you're reciting, so sometimes you get stuck in what the verse is said. So these are the verses, 33, 70, and 71. This is, the nikah performance, these three verses. And this is the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? So those are the conditions. The four conditions for the validity of the marriage is what? Each of the two spouses must be accurately specified while referring to them. For example, it is insufficient for a bride's father to say to the groom as a legal spoken form, I marry you, my daughter. And these are tribalistic concepts. The four conditions, right, for the validity of marriage and the accurate specification of the two spouses. And this is according to Sheikh Al Fawzan in his uh, jurisprudence on marriage. He said, each of the two spouses must be accurately specified, right? while referring to them. For example, it is insufficient for a bride's father to say to the groom as a legal spoken form, I marry you, my daughter. Why? While he has many daughters, right? So even similar to that, he cannot say to the groom's father, I marry my daughter to your son, while the latter has many sons. Right? Now, accordingly, the spouse 
referred to must be accurately specified, either by pointing at him or her, or referring to him or her by mentioning his or her name, or mentioning a certain quality that distinguishes him from her. Then number two condition, the mutual consent. There must be mutual consent between the two spouses. No arranged marriages where one doesn't want to marry them. Like some of these cultural marriages, you force your cousin to marry the cousin. And she was like, I don't want to marry him. I don't want to marry him. So there has to be consent. You cannot force marriages. You cannot force them to be together because you want them to be together. There must be mutual consent between the two spouses. Marriage is not deemed valid if any of the two is forced to accept each other. These cultural, traditional, tribalistic, jahiliya customs have to be put to an end. And you must do it. And you must disobey your fathers and your mothers when they enjoin something that Allah and His Messenger did not author uh, give authority to. You must refuse. And you do it respectfully. Okay? If you sur read Surah to Luqman, it tells you that you obey your mother and father, your parents. But if they tell you to worship something other than Allah, do not obey them, but speak to them kindly. And in this area, most people are forced into marriages and they're not happy from the beginning. Right? Now, according to Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, who narrated the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said there was a previous married, ma uh, a, pre uh, 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 a previous married woman, right? She should not be given in marriage except after consulting her. And a virgin should not be given in marriage except after her permission. And you will find it in Al-Bukhari and Al-Muslim. Now, this applied except for the minor, okay? So we want to make sure we understand that. It's, it applied except for the minor who has not reached what? Maturity. Or it's not applied to the insane, right? As the legal guardian can marry any of them without their permission. And that's the rule on that. Number three, condition. The bribe's guardian's, right? Permission. The bribe's guardian's permission. A woman is to be given in marriage by the permission of her legal guardian. And we're going to get into the legal guardian first, right? Right? And that is according to the hadith of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? La nika bil wali. Right? There is no marriage without a guardian, right? And you will find that in all the five compilers, an nasai right? What are the legal guardians? The Prophet ﷺ said, if a woman gives herself in marriage without a legal guardian, her marriage is regarded as invalid. You understand that, sisters? If a woman gives herself in marriage without a legal guardian, you know what a legal guardian? We're going to get into that. The legal guardian, her marriage is regarded as invalid. And an act is a means leading to unlawful sexual intercourse. And there's a lot of things that happen. So the person who got married, Bismillah, doing that foolishness and saying that the angels is the witness. Now, I'm telling you a real story. This brother told me, I said, who witnessed this marriage? Well, first he gave himself marriage and they gave, gave each other to themselves. And he told me the angels in Allah was the witness to the marriage. A'udhu billahi min dalik. We seek refuge from that. So when you don't have a legal guardian and you are doing this because you got these people running off with each other, I love you, I love you too, and then we're going to go no matter what. We're going to go upon the mountains high because our love is so great. You disobey Allah and His Messenger and you're going to just go and elope with each other. That happened too. Running off thinking that they love each other. You see it really, I lust you, I lust you too. It's not love, you know. Love is infection. Love is legal. 
you know? Love is legal. So they actually really mean, I lust you, and I lust you too. That's what they really mean, because there's no such love doing something unlawful. That's not love. Don't confuse or get it twisted that infatuation has a similar characteristics of love. They're not two the same, okay? So therefore, there is no marriage without a guardian. So, a woman is considered partially unable to choose her best suited husband, almost, in respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and marry the unmarried among you, and do not prevent them from remarrying, right? Now, what is the legal guardians, sisters? First, the legal guardian of a woman is assigned according to this order. First and foremost, her father. Her father is a legal guardian. Of course, many sisters, your father ain't Muslim. Then the, then the situation changed, circumstances change. But let's say, let's give the first criterions of the true legal guardian. Her father is the legal guardian. The second, the one authorized by the father to be her guardian. Whoever the father says, okay, here, he's standing in place of me, right? Number three, her, her paternal grandfather, right? Or one of his paternal male ascendants, right? The grandfather. This is the order. The next in line, her son. Her son or one of his paternal male descendants, right? Male descendants from the son. The next will be her full brother. Her full brother, mother and, same mother and father, right? Same mother and father. Or her, her, paternal, her paternal brother. Her paternal brother is another one that's in line. And then a son of her full paternal brothers, right? Then you will have her father's full brother, right? Her father's brother who they, 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 they have same mother and father, right? A son of her father's full paternal brother. The closest in relative that comes after that. And or if there was a slave, you know, her emancipator, you know. And then the ruler, which would be the Khalifa, but we don't have Khalifa, so the Imam. He's legally. The Imam is the one who appoints a wali to the sister if she don't have these conditions in place. Right? The Imam. Right? And you cannot get someone off the street, no matter how good that brother is, to appoint as a wali. He has to be legal, a legal guardian, and the ruler is the one has to appoint, someone appointed, right? Uh, number four is the presence of two witnesses. That's all it takes to get married, two witnesses. The imam can be in place as the guardian for the sister, right? I know most of the cultural people didn't do it this way, believe me. And I know some of the listeners who come from the foreign countries probably are saying, wow, I've never heard that before. You know, you've seen what your culture has done, right? So the presence of two witnesses, the marriage contract must be witnessed due to the hadith by Jabir, which states that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no marriage without a guardian and two just witnesses right so marriage is not valid except with the presence of two just witnesses and according to At-Tirmidhi who said this condition has been followed by the men of religious knowledge among who among the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and upon the followers who came after them and others and they maintained and said no marriage is valid 
without the presence of witnesses, no one among them disagreed in this regard except some of the late men of knowledge. But from that generation, they knew, right? So, these are the conditions of the marriage. Now, the brother should be able to financially take care of the sister, right? Right? Because this nikah, or contract, is enacted between a man and a woman for the purpose of enjoying each other and forming a good family. So the marriage contract is the formal bond that turns two individuals from strangers to husband and wife, right? And as a result of the marriage contract, many rights and obligations become imperative. It becomes imperative, right, upon each one of them, right? And basically, the marriage contract, sisters, is the most important contract that execute through, through the lives of the marriage couple. And that is because each marriage contract normally carries a lasting effect over a large number of individuals and many of them yet to be born. That's why it's very important to choose mates that are righteous because if you choose a woman that is not righteous, then if you have children, it not only affects the husband, but it affects the children. It was one time that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu was uh, addressed by a man who complained about his son. And the complaint was that his son was very disobedient and disrespectful. So Umar ibn Khattab, he basically ruled in the favor of the father and said, you must be disciplined. So the child came to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu and asked him, can I ask a question, O oh, Amir Mu'minu? He says, Naam. Tafadda. He said, Go ahead. He said, What is the rights that we have as children? He said, The right is that your mother or your father marry righteous men or righteous women. And they have to teach you Quran and also give you Islamic education. So the son said, Well, my father married a Magian. So now, Umar ibn Khattab changed his decision and went to the father and said, your son has a better claim now than you have over him because you married a Magian woman, now you come and complain about his behavior when on the contrary, it's you who married someone who was unrighteous. So now you're reaping what you sow by the behavior of that child. So that's why, sisters, when you choose, you have to make sure your guardian does this job, the wali, and not you, and not going on the internet, and not going on because you don't know who you're choosing. And you are not, not qualified to be able to decipher the slickster, the guy who got all the game. Right? That's why your father's there, because a man knows a man. You see? He knows those ins and outs and things of that nature. And so be careful of what you're choosing and not you choosing, but make sure you go according to the prerequisites that are based on the Quran and Sunnah so, we, so you can have a harmonious marriage. See, the ayat that, was re that was, we recited about muwadda and marahma, that can only be real when you first follow the conditions, you won't have compassion and mercy in your relationship if you're choosing off of the internet and using this old phony system by putting the credit card that these other brothers are doing. Shame on them and they should stop that. You know, it's really not a part of Islam, you know. So if we want to have affection with our mates, we have to make sure we choose. Because if you go to the bar choosing the guy on the corner, you're going to get a corner guy. If you go in the bar, you're going to get a bar guy. You go in the rolling skating ring and choose a man, that's what you get. You see? 
So these are the ways of the Jahiliya ways. We used to, yeah, I met, a, I met a nice girl in the bar. That's the stuff that came from Jahiliya, right? So now you're saying, yeah, I met a nice Muslim brother on the internet, on Facebook, subhanAllah. No. How did you even get the number? How did you get the number? How are you coming to me, daddy? Uh, I have a good prospect. How did you get that? You ain't even supposed to be seeking out, right? So a lot of times we violate the prerequisites and so we find our conditions and then we have an abusive person or psychopath in our lives, you know, a serial killer. You don't know what you're getting on the internet, a serial killer or some kind of freak. And now you bought it in, you had children already, right? And you're raising girls and you get this guy on the internet and all of a sudden now he has sexually abused your daughter, right? And then you wonder why you want to go to court and everything. But you didn't look at the basis of how you got this man in your home. You didn't look at that. You didn't check. You didn't. You don't want to blame where it all started. You start in court where that the abuse came about. But that wasn't the cause. You choose the unrighteous individual because you use an unlawful system to bring about your relationship from the beginning. So now you want to go to court. And I'm not condoning the act of this thing, but I'm telling you the, the reality of how our marriages and how our family uh, relationships are, is endangered species today because of these uh, people violating from both sides, men and women, taking their own, pre their own uh, uh, decision making and trying to do this thing when we have the greatest example uh, of all time of how to do uh, relationships. So we have to start taking a look at the lawful conditions of these, these requirements of our deen. So if you're saying marriage is half of your deen, so when you choose off the internet, what you think your deen? Your deen is shaky. Your deen is shaky if you're choosing off of the internet and Facebook and through these, uh, the dating line games from a, I wouldn't even call it from the Islamic perspective because it's not. It's from the hawa, the desires perspective, you know. So sisters, Please, let us affiliate with the sciences of the people of knowledge, meaning the people of the past who understand this thing better than you and I, who have practiced it better than you and I, who has delivered it better than you and I. And so we need to as affiliate ourselves with those individuals who were the best individuals of human mankind. Wa khuli ka lihada wa astaghfirullah wa hamdulillah rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.